morning. Welcome to Northside. Hi. Hi. Thank you all for joining us today, whether that's virtual. Uh, it's a new way. Last year at Christmas, I don't think we would have ever thought that we've gone through what we uh, have gone through to this point. But there's one thing that always remained the same, and that's Jesus. And during this holiday season, we just want to thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, always remember, it's never a cliche, that Jesus is the reason for the season. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, we just ask right now that you would be with us. Father, we just uh, thank you so very much for continuing to provide, no matter what the circumstances are. And Father, as we are in this holiday season, getting ready to celebrate the birth of your son, uh, we just ask right now that uh, we may do that. Uh, even though the situations are, are different than we've ever experienced before, Father, the one constant in our life is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, 
But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us.
Paul Harvey tells the story about a family on Christmas Eve. The story is too long for me to read the way Paul does, so I will try to give you an abbreviated version while still preserving its meaning. This family had a tradition where the mother and children would go to the Christmas Eve service. The father couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, and so he stayed, and they went to the midnight service. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound. When he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They'd been caught in the storm and, in a desperate search for shelter, had tried to fly through his large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures lie there and freeze, so he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. He opened the barn doors wide, turned on the light, and tried many things to entice the birds into the safety of the barn, but the birds did not come in. And then he realized that they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I am a strange and terrifying creature. If only I can think of some way to let them know that they can trust me that I am not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? If only I could be a bird, he thought to himself, and mingle with them and speak their language. Then I could tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to be safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them, so they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring, and he sank his knees into the snow. Just as the man needed to be a bird to save the birds, Jesus had to come to earth as a man to do the same for us, to show us the way. While on earth as a man, Jesus also gave us an example of how to remember his sacrifice. Matthew 26 verses 26 through 29 describes his example. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. When he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus demonstrated communion for us as a man in a manner we would understand. He demonstrated it so we would remember his sacrifice and how it was the only way to forgiveness. As we partake today, let us remember his sacrifice and be thankful for the forgiveness it provides. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming to earth as a man to show us the way. We thank you for your sacrifice and we thank you for the forgiveness it provides. As we remember that sacrifice today and we partake of the bread and the cup representing your body and your spilt blood, let's do it in a worthy manner, for it is only through your sacrifice that we have an opportunity at eternal life. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome those of you who are watching us virtually today. We're so glad to have you here with us. I want to thank Heath and Kathy and Darcy Sherman for giving us that wonderful welcome. Rhonda, the scripture. Uh, and then, of course, Dell. thank you so much for that uh, communion meditation here today. As we continue in this Advent series, we continue with the lighting of candles. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. And today we light this candle in joy. Advent, after all, is a time of expectation and anticipation, right? That's what Advent is. That's why we have those Advent calendars that count down. We have candles that we, we light one by one each Sunday. But can I give you today an expectation? I'll just go ahead and just submit this to you, and you can just be amazed at my, my great wisdom here, okay? Let me just go ahead and share with you an expectation for this day that I guarantee is going to come true. Here's today's hot take, all right? Something you have planned today will not go as you expect it to. How about that? Something that you've planned today will not go as, you've, as you expect it to. As a matter of fact, you may have already found that to be true today. As you got up, maybe you got around the breakfast table, and in the preparation of breakfast, something didn't go as expected. I got to have an honest admission to you all tonight, and my family will love this, uh, that uh, last night I had intended to make some double fudge brownies uh, after dinner last night. However, I didn't take any care to look at the box when I was pouring in the mix and mixing everything up and reading the instructions even from the box. And instead of making brownies, I happened to make devil food, devil's food cake. <laughs> so we pulled it out of the oven, and it was a lot more fluffier than we expected our brownies to be last night. Uh, and so sometimes things don't go as we expect. And there's always something each and every day that doesn't go quite the way we expect it to go. Maybe it's the amount of sleep you received last night. It didn't go the way you expected. Or maybe it's uh, today you got up and you got the computer open or you turned on the television, the smart TV to watch the service today and the internet didn't work as you expected it to or it's kind of getting buggy and things. These things happen all the time. Advent is a time of expectation. But expectations can be misplaced. An expectation that is met, an expectation that's fulfilled, can bring a ton of joy. But an expectation that's spoiled can bring tons of hurt. See if you can relate to Mary Ann. Mary Ann writes this at the blog along the side of the road, and she asks these following questions. Maybe you've been in this situation before. Have you ever ordered a steak in a restaurant as medium rare, and it gets served to you well done? Have you ever asked your teen in the morning to do the dishes, and then you come home from work in the evening to find that they still haven't been done? Do you ever go to drive somewhere, and it takes you like double the time to get there, longer than expected because of construction? Do you ever do tons of exercise only to get on the scale at the end of it to find that a couple weeks later, the numbers still haven't budged. Do you ever go to your doctor for a routine wax clean out and leave with a surgery date in hand? The following phrase is believed to have originated in 12-step recovery groups, and you've probably heard it before, and this is it. Expectations are premeditated resentments. Expectations are premeditated resentments. And Lamott calls them, she says, resentments uh, are their resentments under construction. Expectations are resentments under construction. Don Sinat write, writes about another experience to perhaps which we can relate. She says this, she says, I'm sitting at a party. I'm sitting at the party. I, I, pl I planned this party so perfectly. I was going to throw a surprise party for my best friend on my birthday. She'll be so surprised. So what happens? She walks in the door, and she looks surprised. She greets everyone. She thanks them for coming. She seems to be happy. Yet, I know my friend. I know her better than anyone. 
I don't feel that she's excited as I expected her to be. I don't sense the appreciation that I had expected. So I start to feel upset. I start even to feel annoyed. And then what's this other feeling that's gnawing at me? I start to feel resentment. All the planning, all the work, giving up my birthday celebration. And I quietly acknowledge what I'm feeling and remind myself expectations are premeditated resentments. We've all encountered times where circumstances didn't meet our expectations. But the hardest failed expectations to withstand, the hardest ones to process, the hardest ones to really wrestle with are the ones where we have maybe misplaced expectations about God and about Jesus. And when we set our expectations in that place and they don't meet those expectations the way we had anticipated they would, that can be very difficult to wrestle with. What are our expectations of Jesus today? And what are our expectations of God? I think I've shared this story before. But when I was a child, I remember once praying very seriously that God would help me to fly like Peter Pan. And and (laughs) if you can't hear that on the audio, that's Amber Parker in the background laughing hysterically at the idea of me (laughs) flying as Peter Pan. (laughs) But it's the truth. It really was true. It's true. I prayed this very genuine prayer as a child, God, help me fly like Peter Pan. And it really was a prayer of faith. I mean, it, was, there, it wasn't something done in, in a disrespectful way to God. It was an acknowledgement. I, there was a part of me acknowledging, God, I know you're all powerful. Uh, and that's what it was. There was, I know you're all powerful, so if you can do this, Lord, uh, that would be fantastic. But the part I forgot about, or the part really I hadn't learned to that point, was that my motivations also matter. And where do my motivations, and how do they align with God's motivations? What does God want to be doing in my life? And so that's something that uh, I I didn't have my expectations in the right place. And as you can see today, my feet are still very firmly planted on terra firma. Happy thoughts aren't going to be taking me up, up and away anytime soon. I was disappointed, though. I was disappointed that next day, and I woke up, and I couldn't fly. And I was without joy realizing that nothing had changed. I'd learned a lot about that all-powerful nature of God, but again, I had to learn that lesson about, well, what are his motivations? What does he want to see in my life? What are the goals God has for my life? And lining my goals up with his goals. I wonder this, what if our disappointment and our resentment toward God has more to do with, with where we've placed our expectations than it does with his character? I wonder, would we be experiencing maybe more joy right now in this moment? And and yes, I mean in this moment. And it was a difficult time. But I wonder, would we even be experiencing that much more joy in this time if we began to expect the right things from God? How might a shift of our focus and our expectations help us find more joy even in the present circumstance? I want you to turn with me today to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 22. John 3, 22, and here's what it says. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them, and he was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there. And if you're going to do baptisms, right, you want to be where water is plentiful. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, he's referring to Jesus here, look, he's baptizing and all are going over to him. And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. But I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine, John says, is now complete. This is John the Baptist. He must increase, but I must decrease. So here in the Gospel of John, mind you, remember, the Gospel of John is written by John the Apostle. 
So we're in the Gospel of John, uh, written by uh, the Apostle, the, the John the Apostle, and he's writing here about, about John the Baptist. And by this point where we see John the Baptist speaking and he's interacting with these disciples there in chapter 3, Jesus has already been baptized by this point. God has already clearly designated him in, 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 to John and, and things as the Messiah. And so that whole, that whole moment of being baptized in the Jordan has already, has already taken place. Jesus' ministry is taking off. And now more people are coming to be baptized by him than, and than are become, becoming baptized by John. And Jesus is drawing even bigger crowds than the Baptist. And it's a prime environment, right, for jealousy to arise. As you see one kind of rising in prominence and the other one sort of diminishing in prominence. And can you imagine being a disciple of John at that point? I think it, we understand what their response is because, you know, we all want to be, we all want to hitch our, our wagon to the, the one where there's success. And so because there's an insecurity sometimes in us that, that we need to be a part of something that seems so successful. And if we're not, it, we kind of start to feel a little insecure about ourselves. And it exposes that. And so they start to feel a little of that insecurity. You know, are they making the right decisions? Have they picked the right horse? You know, and, and uh, they're, they're going through all of this kind of identity crisis in a way. And, and so they come to John and they say, oh, man, what's going on here? This can't be. What do we need to do about this? They're incredibly insecure about Jesus gaining this greater prominence. And John's not, though. John accepts it. He says, bring it on. This is okay. He's receiving it with joy. Why is that? Why, what enabled John to be able to walk through that moment in time the way he did? It's all about John's expectations. It's all about expectations. What John expected of God, what he expected of God's plan and how it would unfold. And I want us to notice today in Scripture what shaped John's expectations to enable him to meet that moment with joy and to be able to rejoice with what God was doing as opposed to being jealous or, or to being resentful of it. First of all, notice this. This is a huge key, I think. John's upbringing shaped his expectations of Jesus. John's upbringing shaped his expectations of Jesus. We're not told a lot about John's growing up years, but we know about, a lot about what happened before he arrived and when he arrived uh, on the earth. If you look uh, over there at Luke chapter 1 for a minute, go with me to Luke chapter 1. We'll read a little bit there of what is told about what happened preceding John's announcement of being born. Uh, and, and when the angels came and, and told his parents about his arrival, Scripture, before we get into that, Scripture makes it very clear that, that John was raised with a very clear sense of where he stood in relationship to God and his plan because his parents had a very clear sense of that. And a lot of that was divine, uh, divinely oriented. That was uh, divinely orchestrated. Okay, and, and he was given specifics. They were given specifics about John that, that most of us as parents, maybe we, we kind of have to learn as, we, as it, a life unfolds. But, but they, they understood where this was going, and we know that they had a very clear idea of this from the outset. Look at Luke chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. It recalls these prophetic words of the angel Gabriel to John's father, Zechariah, who was a priest. Uh, these words that were prophetic concerning John's life. And, and notice what it says. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I mean, that just doesn't it spell out what John's role was. He was going to prepare the way for the Lord. And then later in that same chapter, in verse 76, notice what Zechariah speaks. Now, this is Zechariah speaking to people once his mouth is sort of loosed and he's, he's uh, basically the, the mute button's taken off of him. Uh, that was divinely put there, uh, there at that moment of being told from the angel Gabriel what was going to go on. He, he sort of unmuted at that point, and, and Zechariah speaks these words of prophecy over his newborn son as he's rejoicing over what God has done. And he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. They had a very specific idea, and, and, and it was a blessing of God that God was able to give them such specifics about what John was going to be and where he was going to be able to go. But, you know, I kind of, 
I really think that set John up for success in his expectations as he was being raised and his parents were understanding of the direction of his life, uh, that, that that set his expectations from the very early age of what was going to be his role and how he was going to be a part of this unfolding plan of God. Uh, you know, I wonder today, actually, I, I praise God today. We've talked about it a lot as staff, that I think one of the, the, the silver linings to the cloud we're currently in is that the, the spiritual center of our lives is, is really kind of being put back where it belongs, which is in the home versus, you know, it, it being so focused on, on the church fellowship as a whole. You know, a lot of parents are now being uh, put into that position of being a spiritual role model and, and being the main spiritual influence in, in their homes right now. And uh, hopefully over the years, we've equipped you well to be able to do that. But more than that, God's spirit is with you. I wanted to tell you, parents, God's spirit is with you. You're not going to do it perfectly, but you can do it and you continue to do it. And we want to encourage you in that to be the spiritual role models for the kids. And, the, and even if you're a guardian, uh, the ones who are under your care, we want to encourage you in that work. But that had a lot to do with, I think, the expectations that John had for his life going forward. Number two, John understood that the greatness of his testimony was Jesus. He understood that the greatness of his testimony was Jesus. John tells his jealous disciples in verse 27, he says, a person can't receive one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. It's the same truth that about three or so years later, uh, Jesus is going to share with Pontius Pilate, an unbelieving Pontius Pilate in John 19, 11, He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. All the greatness belongs to God. All the greatness in this world belongs to God. All the greatness in our life is God's artwork. It's his handiwork. Our spouse, our children, our loved ones, they were created. They were authored by God. Your job God created the very concept of economy that this entire world operates on as far as the concept of, of economy, as the trading of goods and the trading of services and the trading of, of, uh, of, of financial resources. God created that concept to being in, even in existence. Our health, our health is a testimony to the amazing biological systems that God created. Now, I know that may be hard to hear right now in the middle of this pandemic because right now bacteria and viruses we're oftentimes thinking of as like the enemy, but it's really interesting. Earlier this week, I was reading an article from Dr. Joe Francis, who's dean of the School of Science, uh, Mathematics, Technology, and Health at the Masters University in California. And in it, he highlighted how science has proven bacteria to be mostly helpful to, and essential to life. You know, we, bacteria is essential to helping us digest our food, uh, to be able to, to have the health that we do. Uh, and so it's essential to life on Earth, aside from the smaller number of, or, of bacteria that produce sickness and illness. Bacteria and viruses both are considered in science to be microbes. And some scientists hypothes hypothesize that the same reality that's true for bacteria, and that there's mainly bacteria serving a good function on the whole in our, in our, in our world, uh, that the same thing may be true of viruses, and there's a scientist who hypothesized this, and all of that would uh, fit within the biblical narrative of a creation whose origins are good, but which later became corrupted in some way. And so even in times like this, biology affirms the greatness of God. But then there's the greatest act ever accomplished on earth, our salvation. And there's only one way that could and did happen. God put his sinless self on the cross to belong to you and me. The greatness, all the greatness of this world is God. All the greatness of this world is God. And like a grateful friend being asked to participate in the honor, the privilege of a wedding, John was honored just to be a part, just to be a witness to what God was doing and to be a, have a front row seat at this plan unfolding, a plan that had been unfolding since before he even drew breath. He was honored just to be there, just to be at the wedding, just to be able to see it happen, to be a part of this plan was enough for him. I love this quote by Eugene Peterson. I want to share it with you this morning. He says this, the assumption of spirituality is that always God is doing something before I know it. So the task is not to get God to do something I think needs to be done but to become aware of what God is doing so that I can respond to it and participate and take delight in it. 
Catch that again. The task is not to get God to do something I think needs to be done, but to become aware of what God is already doing so that I can respond to it and I can participate and take delight in it. It's about expectations. It's about setting our expectations and anticipating, you know, God's already at work. So, so I want to be in focus on what he's already doing so that I can have, be in a, a place where I'm ready to take joy in seeing the work of God unfold. Thirdly, John found complete joy in Jesus' work because he understood his own. That's, the, that's really what ties us all together. He found complete joy in Jesus' work because he understood his own. There's an interesting Greek phrase used in verse 29. It's the phrase that we're, we're the English Standard Translation, the English, English Standard Version we're using, it translates uh, as rejoices greatly. In the NIV, it says that uh, John was full of joy. That's the phrase that it uses there. But in the Greek, the, the phrase that's used is the, is the, the phrase kara kare. Kara kare. And what it is, is it's basically the same word, double. <laughs> it it's, it's intensifies the action of the verb, and it literally means this. It means with joy, he rejoices. It's like joy upon joy. With joy, he rejoices. John is rejoicing with the greatest amount of joy possible. And the reason for that is John is standing at that moment at the confluence of two roads, two pathways in his life of joy, two experiences of joy that are coming together to create a one super highway of joy in his life. These two roads of satisfaction are meeting at this one point. Because John had appropriate expectations of his own role in this plan, as he had appropriate expectations of what his purpose was. Now he can look back and he can look back at his efforts and his ministry, even though he sees it on the decline now. He can look back saying, I did it. He can look back with satisfaction because he had realistic expectations of his own self in this plan. He had goals, he had a task that he could accomplish, and he accomplished it. And so he can look back because he had appropriate expectations and he can say, you know what, and he, and he was faithful to them. And, and he can say, you know, I, I, can, I, I did it. I did what God wanted me to do. And so he found satisfaction there. At the same time, he looks at this other pathway of satisfaction coming into his life and he sees the work of Jesus. And the work of Jesus is significant because it shows that God is, is fulfilling his plan, that God is fulfilling his word, that God is being good to his word by providing Jesus, providing salvation in this marriage of Jesus and his bride, the church. There's hope for the future. And so he looks back at his own life and there's satisfaction and he sees the work of God, and there's satisfaction, and they come together because the expectations are right, and there's a super highway of joy going on in John's life in this moment. He sees Jesus meeting this greater need, and so he's satisfied when these roads come together, even though he knows it means the diminishing of his role in the story. How many times do we rob ourselves of joy because our expectations of ourselves are too godlike? higher than we can attain. And how many times on the other end of this do we rob ourselves of joy in God because our expectations of God fail to remember his ultimate purpose is not to make us happy, but to make us holy and to provide hope, not just for us, but for the entire world. I love what Roger Fredrickson says of John the Baptist, and I think it's true, and I think it's something hopefully a, a, a characteristic that we can all ad, a, a, admire and, and hope to attain for ourselves. He says this, only a great man can accept his demise with joy. Only a great man can accept his demise with joy. Remember Jesus even said, among those born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus even praised the fact that you know, John was who he was, and he was faithful to what God had called him to do. I wonder this, if you knew that your humbling meant the dawn of hope for everyone that you loved and, and everyone beyond that, would you accept it with joy? If the moment of your humbling meant hope for everyone else that you love and care for, would you meet that moment joyfully? Everybody longs for joy that lasts. Joy br Jesus brings the joy that we need, but we must be willing to come to him to receive that joy. That coming to him when we do so is an acknowledgement both of his lordship and the fact that he is, is our savior. It's an acknowledgement of his salvation. 
as well as a joyful acceptance when we do so. It's a joyful acceptance of the role we get to play in this unfolding plan of God. And so here's the takeaway today. To experience enduring joy, we must let Jesus' arrival be a holy invasion of every part of our lives, including our expectations, aligning them with, with his. And today, I just want to help us to find that alignment. There are a few questions I just want to ask you to sit there and ponder as you're listening to this message today that, that I think will help point us in the direction of maybe what steps we need to take in order to align ourselves with where Jesus wants us today. So the first question is this. Let, let Jesus lead you to the answer here. Just imagine him leading you to the answer to these questions. The first question I want to ask and challenge us with is this. What am I blaming God for that I know isn't his fault? What am I blaming God for today that I know isn't his fault? There's a lot of things we know about God. We, we know characteristics about God. He's all loving, that he's concerned for every one of us, that he sent his son to die for every one of us. So with that kind of knowledge about God, that he has plans to prosper us, Jeremiah 29, 11, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. So, so with that kind of knowledge about God, what am I blaming God for that I know isn't his fault? Secondly, what am I shaming myself for that I know isn't within my abilities? Is it a lack of omniscience? Omniscience being as that characteristic of God that where he knows all things. Is it a lack of knowing all things? Is it a lack of omnipresence, a lack of being able to be in all places? Or is it a lack of omnipotence being all-powerful? Are we sitting there, are we acting as though, are we shaming ourselves as though, man, I should have, I should have known that, and I should have been there, and I should have done, and, and are we expecting of ourselves higher expectations, God-like expecta God -like expectations that we shouldn't be expecting of us? What am I shaming myself for that I know isn't within my abilities? Thirdly, where do I see the greatness of God at work in my life right now? Where do I see the greatness of God at work in my life right now? Remember, the, we said it before, the assumption of spirituality is that God is always doing something before I even know about it. He's aware, he, he's working things out the way he worked out this plan for, for centuries and, and generations. He's, he's doing something before I know it. So look around your life right now. What might he be doing right now, even in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic and everything else that's going on, what might he be doing in your life right now that you hadn't considered before? And how might, if God achieved the goal that you think and suspect he might be working for, how might God achieving that goal bring a joy-filled outcome in your life or in my life, in our lives? Number four, what about submitting to God's purpose makes you feel vulnerable and why? Why? And when you think about just giving your whole life and, and, and everything you have to God, you know, letting him, that, that, that holy invasion of every part of our lives, when you think about giving all of yourself to God, what, a par, what part of that makes you feel insecure? And then what does that insecurity, the presence of that insecurity, reveal about what we think may be in a dark part of our hearts about God? If, if, do we really trust him? You know, man... I'm, I'm afraid to give myself over to God because I'm afraid he's going to, you know, send me overseas. <laughs> and, so, and sometimes we, we get into those situations and it's like, well, but God is good. Even if he did send you overseas, wouldn't he take care of you? So what is our fear and what is it showing us about what we believe deep down about God? Our, our greatest fears about him. Why do we feel so vulnerable and so I want to ask you this. What would it look like to simply let Jesus come alongside you and speak to those concerns right now? How would he seek to calm those concerns? What truth about God would he remind you of in this moment right now? If he could just kind of put his arm around you and say, listen, but remember me? Remember me? Remember the Father? This is what we're about. Number five, how are you shepherding others under your care to understand their place in God's plan? How are you shepherding others under your care? You may be looking at this from a parent-child perspective, guardian perspective, uh, or you may, this may be others. You know, maybe you're just a mentor to somebody, or you have people that look up to you in some other area of life. How are you shepherding those under your care to understand their place in God's plan? What words are you speaking and praying over your children or others who look up to you right now? 
you likely don't know the specifics of their life and, and God's intent for their life the way Zechariah knew specifics about John's life. I understand that. You may not have an angelic messenger saying this is what he'll be or this is what she'll be, but there are some truths we know in general about the love of God for everyone in a way that he wants us to be a part of this great plan that's been unfolding to bring hope into this world. And, and how are we setting the stage for that and laying the groundwork in the lives of those who look up to us to, to inherit and accept that responsibility and that, that great expectation? William Barclay writes this, a great preacher once said, Jesus Christ came not to make life easy, but to make men great. Putting our expectations of God and of ourselves in the right place sets us up to experience a joy upon joy. The joy that comes with a life lived in faithfulness to a Savior who himself has proven to be faithful. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for, for being faithful. Lord, you have been faithful to, to unfold this plan in the right timing, at the right moments. Even in our own lives, Lord, you have been there in the right moments to help us find Jesus, to help us grow closer to Jesus, to help us have hope. Today, right now, someone is listening to this. Maybe it's live while this is going out over the online uh, venue, Lord, but maybe someone's going to watch this in a few days. They're going to hear this message, or maybe in a few weeks, months, years, whatever, and that moment is a divinely appointed moment. Well, they will come back to the Savior. They will come and they will align themselves and they will see, Lord, that we will see that we need to align our expectations and our hopes and our dreams and everything for life with you. And when that happens, Lord, the, the joy that we can experience in this life can be mind-blowing. Not because it's easy, but because we're where God wants us to be, and we can see your hand moving, even in the darkest of times, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of all the craziness around us, Father, we can still see your hand at work when we put our expectations on the fact that you want to make us holy, not make us happy, and that that is much, worth much more, much more in this life than happiness. Father, thank you for the hope that you give us, not only for this life, but in what is yet to come because of Jesus Christ. We can live through this time like no one else because, we, because of the faith that we have and the belief that we are not of this world and that there is something greater out there, someone greater out there, and he has provided and his fingerprint is on my life and his fingerprint is on your life. And Lord, you have shown yourself. Father, may our expectations align with yours in this life and may we allow ourselves with humility to be used in your great plan. Let you be the one who dictates the plan. Lord, we love you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you need to make a decision, God's laying something on your heart to give your, your life particularly to Jesus Christ and make him the Savior of your life, maybe you need prayer or maybe you just need to strengthen that walk. We want to come alongside you today. If you would, message us a private message on the Facebook page today, or you can email us at office at NS Christian Church, and we'll follow up with you this week. But we, wanna, we want to do that. We want to come alongside you and help you to experience the path uh, that will bring and lead to, you to such joy in your life. Consider that decision today as we sing our song of decision here as we conclude or near the conclusion of our service.
Well, as always, it has been wonderful to be able to share together in this time of worship with you right there in your living room. And we hope that you and your family are doing well in the middle of this time that we're in. We have a few announcements that I want to share with you before we close today. First, just a reminder, as we do every week, if you'd like to participate in the, uh, the grace of giving uh, and uh, just being a, a blessing uh, and, and being blessed, honestly, uh, by the Lord uh, in the middle of doing so, being generous with uh, what he has given us, uh, you can do that. Uh, online, you can go to the nschristianchurch.org, our website, and go to the Donate tab, and you can set up a one-time or regular uh, gift there. Uh, you can also send uh, donations to P.O. Box 1344, Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, 40324. I had to think about the zip code there for a minute. <laughs> uh, and that's our, that's our P.O. Box. So we're very uh, thankful for how, whatever you can give, however you can give. We know that these are difficult times for people. Alongside that, I just want to mention this. Our elders, as they do every year, have uh, wanted to, to organize a, a love offering for our ministry staff here at the church. And so you can also do that on, through the online giving portal. Go to the website, nschristianchurch.org, uh, and you can participate in that love offering for our ministry staff uh, there. We certainly appreciate that. You, you all are amazing to us. We love serving you. We love being a part of this, this place. Uh, we love you all. We love you all. And, uh, and so we, we thank you for everything and, and all that you, you give and, and the ways that you bless. And even if it's not financially, we, we're, we're blessed to be a part of this church family. But you can do that. You can go to the online uh, donate page there. There's a place there in the online giving portal, uh, nschristianchurch.org, where you can select to, to give to that. And we're going to be uh, leaving that open. The elders asked that that be left open to do so until January the 3rd. And so uh, just, you know, you know you'll have time uh, to do that online if you so choose. Uh, and so we want to make sure you're aware of that. Thirdly, I want to remind everybody about our Angel Tree ministry. Today is the day. If you haven't gotten your, your donation of food or your donation of uh, gifts here for the angels that you've selected, uh, you have about till 1 o'clock today <laughs> to, to do that. The, the families are going to be showing up today to pick up the gifts that have been designated for them. So if you haven't gotten those things here, please do so by 1 o'clock today. Someone will be here to let you in so that you can drop off that donation here at the church uh, for uh, your Angel Tree uh, family. So please take note of that. And then uh, next week, the last thing I have is uh, to let everybody know that uh, starting next week, we will be able to offer the uh, option of an in-person worship service once again. And that'll, the online will continue. Uh, there will be both. We'll kind of go back to the way things were about three weeks or, uh, or more ago. Uh, where we have the in-person and the virtual. So if you are so inclined to come and be a part of a virtual service next weekend on the 20th, we invite you to come. Please know it'll be a family worship service. There will be no uh, uh, kid space that day. We're planning on uh, trying to look at restarting kid space in the month of January following the holidays. So we'll give you more information about that when the time comes. But this will be uh, really sort of how we had done things for a large part of time. Uh, the same protocols will be in place. First of all, if you do not feel well, use the online service. Uh, that's why it's here, part of, a big part of why it's here. And, and so use the online service. Uh, don't come to the in-person. If you are not feeling well at all, uh, we, we, we would love to see you, but we want to see you when you're feeling good. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's just a way of looking out for each other. And I know you all understand that. Uh, but when you come, it'll be the same expectations as before. Social distancing, mask wearing. Uh, we'll have ushers and other people in place to be able to help you find your seat. The seats are marked off so that people are socially distanced here in the room. Uh, and then, of course, people, we want people to enter uh, and, and come to their seat, you know, speedily without a lot of, you know, uh, mixing around in the building. And, uh, and we want the people to leave the same way uh, and utilize green spaces spread out outside to be able to visit and socially distance and things. Uh, all those things we were doing beforehand, we're going to expect the same time. But we are looking forward to being able to see some of you, especially as we anticipate heading into the Christmas holiday. Uh, so we want everybody to be safe. Uh, we want to do it well. We've been great about that uh, in, the, in, the, in times past. Uh, but we, uh, we really want to be able to do this, celebrate However we can celebrate together, we want to be able to do that uh, this holiday season. So uh, that reminder and that announcement is there for you to enjoy today. And with that, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, Wayne, and then uh, we, will, uh, we will conclude our service. 
Have a great day. Have a great week, everybody. We love you. Stay safe. Father in heaven, we are in awe of the way that you chose to save us. And Father, we anticipate with joy the celebration of your son's birth. And Father, we spoke a lot about expectations. And Father, we just want to place our expectations at your feet and allow you to lead us and guide us, not only through this season, but through our entire lives. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in all things. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.